Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with you and very interested to see what's going on in the coming two days. Uh, I really thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to be with you and uh, I thank you for your generous introduction. I was going to say very briefly that uh, because this is probably the first time I attend such a meeting, which is not only scientists but a mix, and I'll go in more detail about that. I should introduce myself. Indeed, I'm a solid earth geophysicist and uh, the main avenues of research I've been pursuing the past uh, three and a half decades are essentially uh, earth dynamics, volcanism, and the relation of volcanism to climate change that has induced mass extinctions at a few very specific moments in the history of the earth. The death of dinosaurs being the most famous ones, but there are other such instances and they are telling us a lot about the way the earth and life have evolved. And my other specialty is the Earth's magnetic field. And it's actually in the course of research on the magnetic field that by chance, as often happens in research, with my colleague Jean-Louis Lemuel and some other people, we formed a little group that stumbled on connections between the magnetic field and climate. And we had no clue as how that could happen. And that is what led us to uh, uh, what has been referred to and uh, the view we are now holding that uh, solar effects are indeed very much present in climate indicators and we believe not yet properly explained by models. Um, but actually, this is not the reason why I'm speaking now. I will be talking science a little bit later. I've been asked yesterday, and only yesterday, by the organizers to uh, uh, supplement my friend Fred Singer because Fred couldn't be with us. And I'm very honored to have been asked to do that. I'm very embarrassed. I mean, all of those of you who know Fred know his style, and I don't think I can match that style. And I'm not sure I have to share with you very important thoughts that you would not have had already yourselves before. But because this is the rule of the game and I accepted it, I'm going to share with you uh, three out of the many lessons that I feel I've learned uh, from working on the subject over the past five years in a way of doing science and interacting with other uh, worlds, such as media and, uh, and the public, that I had not encountered uh, in, previous, uh, in my previous scientific life. The first lesson is that in dealing with climate change, we deal with a very complex problem which has very heavy societal importance. And the result is that we are speaking to a large number of different publics. You have the scientists, you have the media, you have the politicians, you have the general public, and you could even figure out other groups that have to interact. They're very large, they're very complex, and they're very different. And I believe that the unthought of mix of politics and science is very dangerous. And I've described myself in my talks in France as being a disentangler. I'm trying to disentangle science and politics. They're both very important. They're very different. And at first, at least, I want to talk as a scientist. I don't feel I'm competent as a politician. And I think a lot of the problems we've seen in the very bitter battles that have uh, developed over the past 20 years are due to the failure to disentangle the two. And I have a way, I don't know if you will share it with me, of uh, briefly describing that problem in a very simplified way by saying that the scientist has to ask whether a question's answer is true or false. And a citizen or a politician or an ethical person wants to know if it's good or bad. And by superimposing the answers to the question, is it true or false? Is it good or bad? You get into lots of problems because you should never mix these before you understand. A scientist has to know whether it's true or false, regardless of whether, as a citizen, he believes it's good or bad. So that's the first lesson I learned. The second one is that debate is absolutely essential to science in general and to uh, the questions we'll be discussing here in particular. We must remain open. And the problem is that there is a very heavy risk, and when I say risk, it's a demonstrated risk over the past two decades, of dogmatism. And dogmatism on either side. I have learned from my father a mathematical theorem, which I think suffers no exception. That is, the percentage of intelligent and stupid people in any human group is a constant. Therefore, the majority of the moment always has the largest number of intelligent and the largest number of stupid people. So you will find problems if you want to throw from one side to the other, anything at the other one's face, you will find what you need. But if you accept to talk to intelligent people and to be open-minded, then uh, I think that the debate can go on. And I think one of the most worrying things we've heard over the past 20 years is 
the debate is over. I mean, you've heard that since Al Gore's movie and repeatedly, the problem is settled. Anyone who is barely intelligent knows that. Every time you hear that kind of sentence on any problem, not just climate change, you should have a red light, I'm sure you have a red light blinking, saying, ooh, ooh, there's a problem, we're heading towards a totalitarian view and not to an open view of science. And so the question is how to decide things. I happen in my life to have uh, been both most of the time a scientist, but uh, during two four-year terms, I was basically science advisor to the Minister of Research in France. And so I had to ask myself the question, how do I convey a scientific message on scientific areas that I'm not a specialist in to the political people, the government, or whoever has to make a decision? And I would have been tempted at first, to use a system such as the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. Why not? A group of hundreds of the best, most honest, most hardworking scientists on a certain topic in the world. But I think that what we have learned, and what I have learned in the past five years, I didn't realize that before, is that this is absolutely not the way to deal with advice. And I propose to you the following mind experiment. I think that an IPCC-like scheme, it's the first time in our recent history, in our history, that such a scheme has been applied. Let us think of applying an IPCC-like scheme to some of the major scientific subjects of the past 20th century. And if you will, I'll take the one I know best because this is my field, plate tectonics and continental drift. As most people here will certainly know, uh, Alfred Wegener, came up with the ideas of continental drift between 1910 and 1913. By 1913, 1914, a seminal paper has been published. And yet, if you had assembled an IPCC of plate tectonics asking the question, is the continental drift theory valid in 1920, 30, 40, 50, 60, maybe even 70, you would not reach 90% of the best, most intelligent, most hardworking geologists in the world agreeing with it. So that's one thing I want to insist on. You don't have to say these people are stupid. You shouldn't. You shouldn't say they are unethical or they're dishonest. Even with the best people, you cannot get the proper answer before a number of decades. In the case of Contel Drift, an IPCC of Contel Drift with the best people would have been wrong for 60 years and would only have come up with a figure of 90% of the people convinced that it's right by the late 70s or early 80s, which uh, by my standard is uh, fairly recent. So uh, clearly, one thing that we learn from that is science is not decided by a democratic vote. You can be alone and be right. And by saying that, you should not be accused as has happened to a number of us of thinking you're Galileo or something. I mean, it's not because we're alone. We might be right. We may well be wrong. We should always remember. And I will certainly tell you things later today that I think are right, but I'm completely conscious they may be wrong. I think that people who think they're not wrong, who are sure they're not wrong, should beware. And my final word will be on consensus. The way IPCC works is through consensus. Again, I would have thought a decade ago when I was in government that that was a good idea. I think now that it is a disastrous idea for the reason I just showed you. And a simple way to explain it is consensus, as you know, as described, I think I'm honestly replicating it by the IPCC itself, is not one line, maybe not in our 1,000 page volume one report, but at least in the short report to political deciders. I forgot what the exact name in English is, but the, the final thing, which is the only one most people have read, when they have read anything, uh, well, that is the result of consensus, meaning every sentence has been accepted by everyone in the group. Often when I'm opposing someone from the IPCC, he tells me, but we have consensus, what we wrote everyone agrees on. Absolutely everyone. If someone said we don't agree with this, it doesn't go in. That's the best recipe for avoiding any innovation, any breakthrough, any new idea. It's a system that can only be ultra conservative and keep the most uh, weak and, uh, and soft general core to something that has to be sharp and to the point. So that's what I have learned. I have not learned what the solution is. If I was going back to government, which uh, I hope I will never do, uh, I would not be sure how to get advice, and I would get it not in ways that use large numbers of people, consensus, and these the media. And I think the main way is debate. Continuous debate, open debate, tolerant, polite debate, which we all know has not always been the case. 
and I expect that this meeting I will be listening and learning a lot of things. Thank you very much.